Uh, this week I had a strange encounter uh, at my house. Uh, the strange encounter was is I had some people come to my house pretending to be somebody they weren't. They were dressed up, trying to fool us, and they weren't very good at it. It was a facade. It was easy to see through. They didn't look hardly anything like a horse or like Spider-Man. And the worst thing is these uh, human beings uh, were begging. They were begging, actually threatening me that if I did not give them a treat, they would trick me. They didn't trick me at all. I saw right through their costume. I am glad that you find that at least a little bit humorous. Uh, we had a lot of cute kids coming, and uh, there was, <laughs> it, was, it was raining, and parents were out with that. I'm glad you guys still, still, still get to do that, to have little kids. I don't have to do that anymore. Um, that's going to lead us into a thought, because that's kind of humorous, and we all laugh at that, and that's kind of funny. But it's not funny when we wear a facade every day. And that's where we're going to head today in our series in the Gospel of Mark. We've been in the Gospel of Mark for a really long time now. If you've been through this series, I can't even remember how, I think this is 11 or 12 in the series in the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we're in a section in the Gospel of Mark where we are looking at the warnings of Jesus. There are four we're looking at. And uh, the first one we looked at was Jesus warning them to be careful about the leaven of the, uh, the Pharisees. This leaven in which they would want to sign God, prove yourself more. That wasn't enough. Prove it again. That still wasn't enough. I I need to see more. I need to see more. I need to see more. You still haven't proved yourself to me. You must not exist. You must not be God, Jesus. You must not be from Him. And the the kind of what we did the second week after that, and I want to encourage you to keep doing this. I actually kind of sense some of it taking hold in us, is remember what God has already done. That is the antidote for the leaven sneaking in. What has God already done for you? Even if you're not quite sure about God or how to follow Him or if you want to do that, just asking the simple question, have you ever sensed like maybe there was this moment you're not quite sure about? Your earliest memory of Him? You're a little confused by that? Then ask yourself several questions. Have you ever sensed this moment where you felt protected outside of yourself? Many people in Canada believe in guardian angels. Not sure about God, but believe in guardian angels. That doesn't make a lot of sense, but anyway. Um, God says that He does that, and there's kind of this protection that goes out for us. How about provision? You ever had one of those moments, an inexplicable moment? You go, wow, I didn't know. How did, that, how did that find me? I needed that, and how did it get here? And we believe if you start to remember those moments, you won't have to keep asking God, the leaven won't take hold. Well, that's going to lead us now into our next warning from God. And this comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 38 and 40. And we're going to be right around chapter 12 of Mark today. So if you're kind of following, we've skipped a few chapters and we're going to pick up this. And now he's dealing with the scribes. And if you really want to go into some in-depth study, read all the passages before this because Jesus is dealing with the scribes. And here we go. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who, is li- who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at feast, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus has been in a series of conversations about the scribes. Matter of fact, there's been a lot of interaction between him and the scribes. The the disciples that Jesus is talking to now have been witnessing these interactions between the two. These scribes at their kind of base occupation were just people who could write. You can imagine in the ancient world where a lot of people didn't write, there was a need for that. Well, that occupation grew to more of a legal thing. Like we would almost have a legal secretary who would write down legal documents to make sure that they were done correctly. In Israel themselves, that occupation moved even higher into a religious part as well, which the, the scribes could take on a religious connotation. They are the ones who kept the law. They were similar to the Pharisees. They probably were more connected to the temple than the Pharisees were, and the, and the priestly family, and the scribes were the ones who would teach the law. So they were, sometimes in the New Testament, they're actually called teachers of the law instead of scribes. 
So they had become this kind of influential class of people. They didn't necessarily always have a lot of money historically like maybe the Pharisees did. But they had grown to this kind of economic powerhouse of influence because of their position of piety and sharing the law and ensuring that the law was followed. Some of these conversations that Jesus has been having with these guys were very, very like this. (laughs) There was a lot of this. A lot of attacks have been coming from them towards Jesus. But some of them were actually searching And we're going to find both of them today. However, as a group, Jesus describes the the scribes in this passage. He describes them as people who love the fame culture. We understand the fame culture today. Matter of fact, it is the driving force of almost everything. There's very little questions about what's right. It's about, will I be made known? Will I be popular? Will I get elected? Will I have lots of likes? Will I have lots of friends? It's the fame culture. They like to be noticed wherever they went. This is the reason they put on significant religious garb. And it was very unique the way they dressed. So that everyone would see them and go, Oh, a scribe, a teacher of the law, a pious person, a good person, a trustworthy person. They uphold the law. Maybe like we would think of lawyers today. That was supposed to be a joke. Okay, Sorry if there's any lawyers in the room. Didn't mean that too harshly. They love to walk around. The, the Bible calls it the, the, the marketplace. The agora in the ancient world is what it was called. This is, everyone was there all the time. And they loved to go. Because the, the tradition was that everyone, when they would be seen, when a scribe would be seen, everyone had the responsibility, duty, to honor them as they went by. Not quite a salute, but definitely, we use the word, a tip of the hat. To recognize them and maybe stand up and, you know, make sure that they recognized a scribe had come through. When they went to church or the synagogue in the ancient Jerusalem, I mean in ancient Israel, what we would call church, they went to synagogue. They had seats, (laughs) and the seats would be up front. And all the scribes would sit in the seats and look at you. And you would look at them. (laughs) Because it was the place of honor. They were the teachers. However, Jesus reaches to them and says these simple words. They're just doing it for the show. They're just doing it for the show. A pretense of caring. A pretense of loving God, a pretense of loving people, but it's just a show. As a people of influence, the scribes had the opportunity to take advantage of other people. They were trusted. And so widows, particularly wanting to know what to do with their money that didn't maybe have quite as much information as they want, could be tricked into giving some and Oh, yes, I'll make sure that gets where it needs to go. There's a well-known case in Rome in which this actually happened in the synagogue in Rome. And the scribes who did this actually caught the attention of the Caesar and got in serious trouble. Can you imagine that? So bad it went to court in in Rome, embezzling embezzling widows' money. The Gospel of Mark is written to the... To, uh, to Rome or from Rome, and at least there's some connection with Rome, so this may have been well known. And so these people had this kind of ability to use their position to take advantage. Then they would go about hiding their greed through lengthy prayers. Their prayers were to push people's thoughts aside. I wonder how that, you know, what do they really like? No, 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 I love God. Let me show you how much I love God. And Jesus steps into this reality and says, guys, I want to warn you, disciples, Peter, John, I want to warn you guys about this. Because one day, they don't know this yet, you're going to be well known. You're going to actually be really influential. And I want to ask you a question, disciples. 
Do you want to look right or do you want to be right? If you want to memorize just a quick saying, and I know you've heard me say this before if you've been here a lot, do you want to look right or do you want to be right? This question can challenge every corner of your life. Your relationship with your spouse, your kids, your friends, your neighbors, how you deal with your money, how you work, how you worship, your love for God, your love for the poor. It will challenge every part of you. Do you want to look right or do you actually want to be right? Jesus warns them that these kind of people, these scribes, are dangerous in your life. And I want to warn you the same. These kind of people can be very dangerous. They smile, they wave, they love honor. And all the time behind their smiles and their wave, they're thinking, how can I use you for my advantage? How can I take advantage of you? What can you do to help me step up a little higher in honor? What can you do for me? The challenge for us is that it's very easy for that thought to sneak in and become part of us. Maybe not even meaning to. Once again, Jesus is warning us. There's a reason why he's warning his disciples. This is not just a a, a random statement. This is a serious thing that Jesus is going, look guys, this happens to people. Maybe people who at the beginning set out to do the right thing, want to be right with God and love people, and before they know it, they've been sucked in to just looking right and not being right. Because sometimes it's just easier to pretend. It's just a lot easier to put on a costume and pretend to be right than it is actually to be right. After Jesus warns the disciples, the next story in context, the very next story, is designed to interpret the other one. And, and they go side by side. And, and it picks up the next story in, in verse 41. And the story molds into Jesus is now in the temple and he's watching a widow. The widow has come in and she has begun to drop her coins into a box. And so we have this kind of connection between these scribes taking advantage of widows and the pious widow. Here's what it says in chapter 12, verse 41. And he, speaking of Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. He called to his disciples and said to them, Truly I say to you, the poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. It's an interesting kind of story where we find ourselves. They're in the temple, and the temple had 13 boxes to put money in. Each one of them had a, a very small opening at the top, and then it, it grew to much larger. And matter of fact, they said it kind of looked like a, a horn, if you can imagine some type of musical instrument horn that bellowed out to collect the money. I want you to just kind of think about this a couple things. There's 13 boxes. Each box had a label on it what it was for. All the different offerings that needed to come to the temple. Some of them are, were very specific for sin offering or fellowship offering. And instead of having to actually slaughter an animal, you could put the amount in and the priest would take care of that for you. But there was also free will offerings that were just generic. and they, I think there were four of those that they could just put money in. I want you to kind of get the image of this. All money, of course, is made of coins. They're all made of metal. There's no paper. So I want you to imagine this scene that Jesus is watching, and there's this little opening, and rich people are coming, 
And what are they doing? They're opening bags and can you imagine the clatter and ching, 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 ching when it hits the bottom? And people would notice, wow, that was a lot of coins. Those didn't sound like copper either. That sounded a little heavier. And then in comes the widow. Clink, clink. Two small, small copper coins rattle down. Her gifts exhibited her heart. There was no pretense for her. What she was doing was an act of love, obedience to the commands of God to bring an offering to the temple. It was either an act of repentance or love of God or love of humanity. That's the only offerings that were there. And while she's doing that, rich people are struggling because it's so easy to be noticed as they're dropping their loud, clanking coins into the pot. And everyone takes notice of them and recognizes them. But no one notices her. Clink, clink. No one even sees except Jesus. He notices Because he notices the heart. And then he reveals a whole different kind of economy in this moment. All the other clanking was just clanking. It meant nothing to him. Their hearts were not there. Oh, but her. As Jesus says, she put in more than all the rest of them together. Because she gave everything. And it reveals what she felt. And what her heart was like. Because deep within, she was right. She didn't really care what she looked like. Well, if we look in the Gospel of Mark, preceding these two stories, there's a previous story. Matter of fact, a more well-known story. This story is found in chapter 12, verse 28. So just before the first story read. And I want to come back to it because, once again, it's an interaction with the scribe. And one of the scribes asked him, speaking of Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the Shema. Rejection of polytheism. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. While Jesus had had interaction with many scribes, it was very like this. This scribe says these words, Jesus, you've answered well. You've answered so well. Love of God and love of others, this sums up everything. For Jesus being right, Listen carefully, for Jesus, being right is only fulfilled in unfeigned love of God with no pretense, no hiddenness, holy and genuinely, and must be complemented by love of neighbor. If you want to know, what what does it mean to be a Christian? Love of God. Unfeigned love of God, no pretense, that reaches down and loves my neighbor. When Jesus warns against the pretense of the scribes, he's referring to their love of God. Their love to be seen had taken over their love of being right with God. Their facade was more important to them than actually knowing God. Now, my guess is if we could bring one of those scribes here today and say, hey, did did you love God? Yeah, of course. I love God with everything. But only one of them in this whole series is declared to be close to the kingdom of God, the one that asked Jesus this question. 
There was no evidence of it, of their love of God. Or there was a lot of evidence that they did not love their neighbor. See, when Jesus puts these two together, love God and love your neighbor, he avoids two dangers. The first danger is mysticism, which says, I love God, and that's separate from what I do over here. It's separate from how I treat you. It's separate from how I pity the poor and how I react to need that I see around me. I love God, and he and I are just doing our own thing. It warns against that danger. But it also warns against the other danger, and I think this one's actually more uh, who we are in our context. It warns against humanism, which says, I love people, and we don't need God to love people. It ignores the person who made these people, the people, the, the person who loves these people, God himself. And Jesus declares that it is impossible to truly love humanity without loving their maker. The order in which they come, love God and love your neighbor, states that it is a prerequisite of knowing God and loving God to actually truly love people. Without it, we will move in the direction, sooner or later, of pretense. So being right not just looking right, begins with love of God. Mark chapter 12, verse 40. I want to read the last part of this one section again because we didn't really mention it. At the beginning, it says this, who devour widows' houses, speaking of the scribes, and for pretense make long prayers. And then these very telling words from Jesus, they will receive the greater condemnation. Because they were people of influence and people of position, they abused that, and because of that, judgment would be intense. See, because being right versus looking right is serious business. And I want you to begin a moment of self-reflection. Not that any of us would claim, oh no, I'm, I love God, there's no facade here. But a moment of self-reflection to see if even the smallest hint of pretense has begun to creep in to you. Do you like to be noticed? Would you admit that sometimes you struggle? with just wanting to look good, and being good is too complicated. It's too humbling. It's too difficult to look to God and go, God, I really messed that up. Forgive me. I want to ask you a very simple, straightforward question. I've been asking myself. I think it's a great one for all of us. Is there any evidence in your day-to-day -day life that God is first? If you were to sit down and take an evaluation of your time, your money, your affection, your emotional energy, where would God come in those areas of your life? Is He first in worship, devotion, time? I want to challenge you, not harshly, but just as Jesus was with his disciples. Guys, I'm warning you, you can get drawn in here. You can start taking steps. It only takes one time where you don't go, oh man, I was wrong there. I'm going to hide that. I really sinned in that moment. I'm going to hide that and pretend. My motives were wrong then. I really stepped on that person, but I got ahead. I'm going to hide that. And pretty soon, we're wearing a costume. The scribe who was asked Jesus the question, what's the greatest commandment, is told at the end of this interaction with Jesus that you're near the kingdom of God. 
And he wasn't near the kingdom of God because his theology was right. He was near the kingdom of God because his heart was moving towards Jesus. All the other scribes had kind of looked at him and said, no, no, we're not following you. Facade. But this one scribe starts to go, that was a great answer. That sums up everything. And every time he did that, he was opening himself to a little bit more of becoming right with Jesus. And maybe today, it's time for you to do that as well. The song that I ask you to remember the words, soften my heart. If you would look at this and you hear all this and you go, you know what? There's been some pretense in me. God, I need to remove that. Once again, Jesus is not angry. He's just warning. It's so easy to get here where the facade is just coming up. Is God first? And do you love people? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this great, powerful warning from Scripture. Each, each person in this room, if, if we were asked, we would say we want to love people. We want to love you. And yet day by day, it gets really easy to pretend. Because sometimes we don't like admitting we failed. Sometimes we just want to do our own thing and we realize people need us. But God, I pray even in this moment that you would help each one of us in a moment of reflection. Do we really love you? Are you really first? Is it evident in our time, our worship, our emotional energy, our finances? Do you come first? And this morning, God, we want to commit to you that we want that. We want to be right with you. And then ultimately, with the others around us. So God, we confess that we have failed at moments, sometimes seasons of life, where we have not put you first. We have run our own schedules, we've run our own finances, we've run our own emotions. We've rejected calls for you to love people, our neighbors, people at work. We've rejected calls of repentance to make it right with someone or with you. And this morning, God, we admit all of that and ask that you would cleanse us and make us right with you today. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And we will worship you because we know that you are a great God and a merciful God. 